Okay, so I'm back with my friend Russell here. Last time we spoke about Princeton mental health, we talked about Russell's track career, and we got into the depths of all of those things. I'm a huge track nerd, so we, we spent way too much time on that, at least probably by most people's standards, not by mine. And mental health, which we both struggle with, and we, we sort of bonded over that and spoke about that. And we spoke about our experience at Princeton, which I thought was quite interesting, and it illuminated you know, the importance of surrounding yourself with different people and having different experiences, um, not sort of just admonishing yourself to one small corner of campus or one identity, but instead, you know, fitting into various groups and learning from them. And you shared some really interesting things with me about how the track team is set up and, and how that panned out um, and had some racial, at least undertones, if not overtones. Um, so I thought today, you know, let's just really get to the heart of it, which is, you know, race and what's happening in our country more broadly right now. Um, and, you know, to state the obvious, I am a, a, you know, a white man and you are a black man. And we obviously have different experiences of our country and, and, and you know, our immediate circles growing up and so I think, I hope this can be a really interesting, informative discussion. I'm sure I'll learn a lot and I hope that whoever's listening learns a lot too. Um, and that, I don't know, maybe this is too grandiose. You can tell me if it is, but I, I guess I just wish that more conversations were happening where people were talking to people that are different than they are, whether it's racial hmm. or otherwise. Um, and this, that these conversations were having happening more um, in a, in a even keeled, loving, intellectually honest way um, so that people could understand each other a bit more and work towards a solution. Um, so I guess just to kick things off, you know, we've been friends a while, but you really came back on my radar in a big way when, you know, you were posting a lot about the Brown University track program and you penned an article that went viral and Malcolm Gladwell was retweeting it and so on. So I wonder if you can just tell people that are listening about that and what that experience was like and what came of it. Right, right, so thank you for that. So um, <clears throat> for those who don't know, um, uh, I ran track and field at Princeton. James and I, we know each other from Princeton University. Um, and um, Brown University announced at the end of May that they were cutting their track and field program um, and uh, they were cutting a number of teams and they were effectively replacing uh, those teams with uh, <clears throat> with sailing for Title IX reasons is what they stated. Um, the decision to cut those teams was due to wanting to reduce their number of teams so that they could, so that Brown University could take the money that they uh, earmarked for athletics and kind of... Uh, uh, have it be dispersed amongst a smaller grouping of teams. So each team would end up getting, you know, more funding resources. Um, and then they also noted that the decision was also due to diversity concerns as they wanted to try to diversify both their varsity and their club team offerings. Um, so they were demoting all of the varsity teams that they were cutting down to club status, including track and field. So putting track and field as a club team would diversify the club team offerings. The issue is that the club teams- they diversify? It would diversify their club team offerings. Um, um, so uh, Brown's club team, so track and field would now be, would have yeah, been was it, was a club it team. racial reasons? Or you mentioned Title IX, which is about gender. So was it mostly racially motivated? The university just said diversity. Hmm. So that's all they said. Okay. So um, yeah, you can read into that how you want to look into it. The issue that I saw, um, you know, because diversity, there are uh, many different aspects of diversity, you know, racial, gender, otherwise, um, is the fact that they were removing a varsity team that had the second highest number of black male students, uh, athletes on it, uh, second of football, and was one of their most diverse teams, just period, on their campus. They were demoting that and effectively putting sailing in its place. Sailing, which is a team that is very homogenous, not only in terms of race, but also in terms of socioeconomics. Um, I had a big issue with this, and so I wrote an article in Medium. The intention of the article was to try to get the article in front of a major media um, source so that someone would report on the story. I did not write the article 
with the intention of the article itself being the catalyst for change. Um, mostly because I'm not a person with a platform. You know, I'm, I'm not a person, um, uh, well, you know, now things are changing a little bit, but um, especially at that time, I did not have a platform at all. Um, you know, I have 400 followers on Twitter. You know, I, my medium articles would usually get about 100 people reading it, reading them. So I had no intention or expectation that my article would um, really go that far, um, but I wanted to write it on a public platform and then use that to try to get others to report on the story. Um, and that was really my intention. Um, to go to dig a little bit uh, deeper, the reason why it was such a big issue for me is because um, a lot of people think about athletics as being, you know, gateways to uh, these opportunities, um, and they are, but. Um, Besides football, basketball, track, and to a lesser or more extent, soccer and baseball, college sports are pretty homogenous. Um, they're pretty white. And in the Ivy League, they're, they heavily skew towards these more affluent sports um, that are much harder to participate in if you are from different economic backgrounds. Um, and they are sports that, frankly, you know, are only played um, by people who live in certain geographic areas um, that tend to be you know, white affluent folks. Um, and so when a varsity team is created or varsity athletics, uh, when they exist, they get recruiting spots, which are like guaranteed, essentially guaranteed slots into the university. Club teams do not have recruiting slots. So what the university was doing, they were taking away one of their few diverse sports and then replacing it with a sport that is very homogenous, not only in terms of race, but socioeconomics. I mean, track and field is the cheapest sport to participate in in high school. Sailing is off the charts, expensive. Um, you actually need access to open water. And so even that limitation, there aren't many places in the United States, save for the coast and the Great Lake states that have access to open water. You can't sail on a river. And so even that limitation makes it such that, um, you know, uh, that sport would only really be able to, you know, service a certain, you know, very small segment of the population. Um, and the two biggest kind of admissions advantages into Ivy League type of schools are athletics and legacy. And so those two um, uh, kind of advantages heavily advantage those from certain backgrounds. And so um, we look at the Ivy League as a whole, I think it's in the 60, 67, something like that percent of the Ivy League athletes are white, um, which is higher than, you know, kind of uh, what is more broadly uh, for the NCAA. Um, so it was really these entrenched pathways. And so I was um, really aggrieved and upset that Brown was taking away one of their truly you know, egalitarian sports, they were taking that one sport away. And so those opportunities would no longer be there, would be available. Um, you know, that was something that really did not sit well with me. Um, I got active around it. And so when I noticed that my articles started going viral, I then switched my focus from trying to get the article in front of someone else to report on it to just trying to get the article in front of as many eyes as possible. Um, I took podcasts, uh, you know, interviews. I interviewed, uh, you know, I did a bunch of podcasts uh, that have wide reach. I contacted one of the top um, track and field websites uh, on the web, uh, Let's Run, and they featured the article on their site. Uh, you know, I really kind of, actually, it's funny, um, my uh, part-time job that I have, I um, I had to email them and say, hey, listen, I know I'm behind on this project. I'm working on this thing. I will get back to you guys. And then when I, um, I, I literally showed him an interview that I did with ABC. He was like, hey, like, this is what I'm doing right now. Then he was like, oh, okay. Take as much time as you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, they, they were really supportive after they heard about that. But it was just, it was just really interesting, um, uh, you know, that I kind of had to um, – that I had to kind of give that caveat, but yeah, it was a, um, it was a really interesting experience, um, especially being someone, um, you know, to experience something go viral and have it not be like a dance or TikTok video or something like that, but to have it be something, and not to say that that stuff, you know, doesn't have its value, but to have something. You say that. <laughs> no, I think things are. 
I think things have different meaning in different contexts. So, I mean, I like silly TikTok videos too, but you know, this is something a little, uh, you know, it's just different. And so, I mean, what it feels like, Russell, I mean, like, you know, we not to, I, I want to really bring this back and focus this as much as possible on, on race and, and where we are as a country. Cause you know, even a lot's changed in the past month or two as, as things have transpired. Um, in my opinion. Um, but I'm interested what that just quickly, what that kind of power feels like. I mean, so, you know, you sort of say something like we all, we all post things, right. We all sort of say things. And as you said, a hundred people might hear it and so on. And that's sort of the way things always have been. If you said something in your community, people would listen and you reach a few people, but like really reaching people and having your voice and, and an important cause be amplified like that. What, what went through your head when you, you know, all of a sudden checked and it had a half a million readers or, you know, what does that feel like? Yeah. Um, I haven't actually thought about it too much, uh, you know, to be honest. I mean, in the moment, it was just, I was so hyper-focused on the goal that I wasn't even worried about, oh, this is looking good for like me. Because I wasn't even worried about me or, or a platform or like my brand. Or it, like none of that was important. It was kind of funny because afterwards, um, uh, so I mean, it gives people some context. I wrote the article in a week later, Brown University reversed their decision. It is not, I'm not saying that it was completely me. That would be a mischaracterization of everything that occurred. There was a really organized group of Brown track alumni who were doing a lot of internal kind of pressure work. Um, but I do know that the article was really important for kind of the outside pressure that was, that was kind of, uh, that the university felt. So uh, yeah, that's, that's that. But I was just so hyper-focused on the goal that I didn't even have, I didn't even think about or have time um, to think about what, uh, what it meant or how it felt or anything like that. And it's funny because after it happened, um, I was starting to get, I got a bunch of interview requests uh, and um, I've been doing interviews since then. And it's like, wow, it's funny. Cause it's like, I, you know, I did, you would think that I would have something like, all right, made like I have a website and I can kind of pitch that and pitch that. Like I actually did an interview the other day um, where uh, it was a local TV affiliate was interested in the story and I said, okay, yeah. Um, so do you have anything that you want to promote any kind of business or, and I was like, you're like, how about the cause? Is that enough? Yeah, you, know, <laughs> you know, it's just like, that's just so funny that that is, you know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm actually starting to think more about, okay, how can I be more meaningfully engaged um, in doing some of this advocacy work um, in a more um, kind of formal capacity. So those are things that I'm thinking about now, but in the moment, like, and I think that's kind of the beauty of it. Like I did not do it at all thinking about me, <laughs> like, oh, in terms of the, energy that I put forth was based off of my own experience and wanting others to have that kind of experience of being able to use sport as a pathway. But I did not center my own sort of aggrandizement or platform building or anything of that nature in my advocacy. Um, yeah, I was just really hyper-focused on, okay, we need to save those spots for those kids because there's a kid I don't know who is in Baltimore who is in Tuscaloosa <laughs> who is in you know the middle of um, Texas who is in Kentucky um, who is in Washington State who is a really good athlete and who may have a life-altering opportunity through a recruitment spot to Brown University yeah. and that was something that I needed to see maintained well dude maybe there's something to that you know that you you kept your ego yourself out of it i think so much of what happens these days is you know again sort of a silly example but think about getting people to wear masks mm -hmm. and then think about how it became politicized and it's like okay well there's one bit of messaging that's just like it's important for people to wear masks so that we don't all get sick and die Oh, and then by the way, it has a lot to do with your political lean. It's like, no, it doesn't. It has to do with keep people keep, you know, pe keeping people safe. So mm. same sort of thing here where it's like, you know, I think when stories have too much going on, when it's like about Russell pushing himself forward and trying to push something and, and oh, and by the way, there's an important cause, it gets a little muddy, but when it's like, mm. no, there's a cause 
And that's why I'm telling this story. I think it's a sharper story, right? And, mm. and maybe that helped it kind of break through the noise and, and really reach as many people as it did. Do you think there's something to that? Yes, and I also think that people can tell when someone is led by passion, you know? Um, and, you know, I think people can sense that. I think people can gravitate towards that. There's an authenticity to that that is endearing, and I think that people respond to it. Um, to kind of, you know, talk about, you know, about something that's going in the political environment right now, I think that's probably one of the reasons why uh, we've seen, um, you know, in terms of the Democratic Party, we've seen some pretty big upsets. Uh, there is a, a Congress, uh, well, uh, someone um, who challenged uh, one of the congressional candidates, or no, congressional incumbent, uh, Lacey Clay, Cori Bush, uh, beat him with a fraction of the money, um, but she was a Black Lives Matter protester. And when she talks about her experience of being, having been homeless with her kids and being uninsured and, and still um, going out and, you know, being a part of the protest movement because it was important for her to fight for these issues. I think people see that. Um, uh, Jamal Bowman um, also took out a really, um, a, um, a really long-term powerful incumbent. Now, whether or not you, you know, agree with their politics or not, it's just about the fact that I think people are responding to people who are led by passion um, and, and, and the authenticity of that passion. Um, and so my kind of work, you know, is in electoral politics. You know, I, I wasn't campaigning for, you know, two years. But I think the fact that, you know, I, being a person who did not go to Brown University, I've never even been to Brown University. I've never been to their campus. Um, I don't know many people who went to Brown besides people who ran track. Um, and I have a buddy who's on a crew um, there, but that's about it. Um, the fact that I fought so hard um, for an opportunity that isn't really that connected to me. I think people saw that and responded to it. Um, and the thing that was really kind of important, and I think a lot of people kind of got it, was the decision uh, that Brown University made came just uh, uh, just a few days before George, George Floyd's murder. And, um, and then universities kind of, uh, after George Floyd was murdered, they released a uh, statement saying that they were going to commit themselves to doing the work of understanding, you know, racial grievance um, and, you know, commit to building policies and programs and, and, and learnings and all this language and jargon. However, sure. they just, you know, they had just cut, you know, one of their most diverse teams that had 11 black guys more than their crew, soccer, um, ice hockey and lacrosse teams combined. They had just cut that team. And then a few days afterwards, made, made a statement about how they were going to commit to these issues. It, it rung hollow. And that was one of the things I brought up in the article. And I think a lot of people saw that because right now, I think what we need to move from is kind of talking is important and we need to have that step. We also need to see action, action. and see actual tangible kind of commitment. So I, I wanna focus most of our time on that because I just I want this talk to be as actionable as possible for people that do want to make a difference, um, which I, I know is a very complicated proposition. But I just have one question for you before we get there about the specific um, you know, occurrence, Russell, of, of you basically helping to reinstate the, the Brown University track team. Um, it's sort of a big thought, but I'm sort of interested. So, you know, the premise of what you said is like, listen, I had a shot to get into Princeton because of my athletic ability, right? And that kind of, that put me on, right? Because an implied um, thing that you're saying there is that get, you know, going to Princeton is, is a, a good thing um, mm -hmm. or that going to Brown is a good thing. It, it helps you move up in society and have opportunity and so on. Um, and so for a long time, that's been the case, hundreds of years, right? That these institutions have been held on high as sort of like, this is where the best and brightest go. But some, an irony that's not lost to me in all of this, Russell, is that, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, like Princeton University, Brown University would speak 
and people, you know, people, the country, you know, would listen, right? Like they were held on high as a university. But the interesting thing about this story for me is that you, an individual, mm -hmm. spoke and you brought an institution, a powerful institution to their knees, right? Like you made them change publicly and say like, we fucked up, big time mistake, whoops, reverse a decision. And I know you're not saying that you're the only one who, who caused that, but the power that you have as an individual in 2020, as opposed to if this had upset you and occurred you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago is amazing. And so I'm just, I'm wondering if you can respond to that just sort of the power that these institutions have to put someone on and change their life forever, but indeed also in 2020, how much power the individual has and how much by comparison, perhaps less. I wonder if you'd agree with that statement that, that uh, you know, we as individuals can have a lot more power than we used to. Oh, no, I would certainly agree with that statement. I mean, um, it's kind of interesting. It's, uh, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, in kind of this hypersaturated media landscape, um, digital media, uh, traditional media, social media, and otherwise, print media. Um, there's so much content that's being generated all the time that it can seem like an impossible task to produce something that will have any sort of import or gain any sort of traction or or kind of be something that responds, um, you know, uh, to the moment. At the same time, our hyper connectedness and the way that we are kind of uh, in this instant communication landscape allows for allows for people to have the opportunity to have that right message at the right moment that can kind of catch on. And so, and that's hard to, that's hard to kind of figure out. Now, the people, you know, kind of talking about the TikTokers or what have you, uh, or the people who were on Vine, you know, before um, dating myself with that one, or, you know, people that are on YouTube or whomever. Graham Reel, you gotta be real <laughs> current, man, real current. <laughs> um <laughs> instagram reels yeah you know <laughs> um these are the folks um that have kind of figured out how to quote unquote hack that system um uh, and you know make viral content you know kind of consistently uh but for most of us that's not something that we really you know expend our time thinking about and most of us you know aren't necessarily going to uh, produce something that's going to go viral um, or catch on to that way. And most of us, even if we really tried to, um, it probably won't necessarily uh, work. These things kind of have to uh, be the right message at the right time. So if I had written that article even a year and a half ago, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. It was really the timing of Brown University making that decision and it coming right on the unfortunate heels of a tragedy that we all kind of witnessed collectively. And all of us having a collective response to that tragedy and then speaking on that tragedy and how you know the impacts of that tragedy has made us think about these issues more broadly and bringing that issue to the fore within the context of Brown University's decision. That is why I was able to have, um, you know, um, traction, you know, uh, with, you know, with the argument. I think, um, yeah. So it it so, really so, so is really just quick, about really quick on that, Russell, because um, I want I want to get into Black Lives Matter, um, and then and then broaden out even further. Um, sure. But really quick, I I wonder if you feel that. You know, the institutions of old, right? Like ba basically what you what you're, you were saying, it sounds like, and I deeply agree with, is that, you know, for example, you just compared the Ivies to uh, other NCAA schools and that you said 67% of athletes at Ivies are white, whereas uh, that number is lower at other NCAA mm -hmm. schools. So the institutions of old, the like, you know, the top universities, you know, are sort of there's an, an inherent bias, there's an inherent racial, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I would go so far as to say or you would go so far as to say it's inherent racism, maybe, 
but there's an inherent bias there, um, just numerically speaking. Do you think so? And those institutions, Russell, used to be the gatekeepers that determined who had a voice and who didn't in this country. Do you think that the digital landscape, like say Medium or YouTube or TikTok or all the things you just mentioned, do you think that those platforms are less biased? In other words, the voice of anyone, whether you are, whether you are small because you have 400 followers and that's it, or whether you're small because you're a woman, and not a man, or small because you're gay and not straight, or small because you're black and not white. Um, do you feel that those democ democratized platforms even the playing field more than the older systems? Or do you think that the same racism that marks the older institutions also mark the new institutions of YouTube or Instagram Reels or whatever? I wish I could say it was incredibly straightforward and yes or no answer. It's not. Um, and that's just being, you know, kind of uh, just blatantly honest. We have a, so on one hand, yes, these platforms do provide more of an opportunity for some voices that may have otherwise never had an opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, have, um, have a voice for lack of a better word and to reach uh, mass audiences to t uh, talk about issues. The whole Black Lives Matter um, you know, uh, movement was spawned by three um, black women, I believe black queer women, who organized most of this on social media. And the, um, the first uh, uh, march, I believe, was in New York City. Um, and so something like that, um, you know, could not have occurred um, in a previous uh, iteration, generation. Um, it would have occurred in a different way. You know, we, the watch on March and the watch the march on washington right. for jobs and uh, jobs and freedom which people forget about that last part of it but you know that's another point but uh um, the march on washington that happened in 1963 i believe um and the bus boycotted all the and um uh the freedom riders and uh uh snick you know all of these organizations um they organize you know in a you know pre kind of communication a pre you know digital communication landscape so this stuff occurred, it's just having something occur so quickly, um, you know, I believe um, is something that is really unique to what we're seeing now. But I don't want to, I don't want to have people think that, you know, just technology by itself without a critical lens and a critical approach is the answer. I mean, we're already seeing a lot of issues with the ways algorithms are, are written and how they prioritize certain content over others. Um, you know, uh, there was a lot of conversation about TikTok and their algorithms, um, how they were de-emphasizing um, or uh, not allowing uh, be like Black Lives Matter content to trend um, on their platform in the way that other platforms um, had and so there's a bit of a curating that that occurs, even from the standpoint of who is producing the algorithms. I mean, uh, the people who are working in Silicon Valley, um, unfortunately, you know that space is not very diverse, right. and people have these inherent biases that end up in the code that they produce and the algorithms that they create that they write. And so that needs to be addressed. And that needs to be thought about. Um, I mean, there's been uh, some research that's shown. Um, you know, many different instances of racial bias in algorithms that are supposedly supposed to, uh, you know, remove bias from, right, remove bias from situations. Um, there is an example, um, uh, I can't remember exactly the uh, municipality, but they were using uh, algorithms in the criminal justice system to kind of speed up some uh, some processes uh, with kind of uh, some low grade offenses. And some research into that process showed that ob <laughs> like objective kind of low grade offenses that should have similar kind of discipline or similar um, sort of a sentencing um, in terms of community service or fines or what have you, um, people who were black or, or crimes that were committed by black people that were still low grade had 
worse sentencing outcomes than people who were white, even though an algorithm was, was bi- right. And so it's like these biases were literally well, written into the code. And yep. so that so these kind of thoughts, um, you know, about what we need to be doing in terms of okay, um, we need to also be thinking about you know how we're going to ensure that as we continue to have an increasingly more automated world, how that's going to impact uh, you know people who are black and brown. But then also one thing that I really worry about, and I think we need to talk about this uh, more kind of broadly too as a society, is what's going to happen in an increasingly automated world. Um, what's going to happen to those with, without a technological or a kind of multifaceted skill set that will allow for them to pivot in the new landscape. And so people yeah. that have gone to you know, uh, that, that have a high degree of technical proficiency will be fine. And then folks who have gone to elite universities or who have accumulated a lot of these soft skills that will be prioritized in an increasingly white collar work environment, they'll be fine. But people who do not have the skill set, um, which also falls along racial and some gender lines as well when we think about it, um, how is that going to impact those populations? I mean, that these are conversations that uncomfortable conversations that we're going to be need to be having. You know, fast, and, fast, man. The next five, you know, five, ten years, this stuff's happening, like it's barreling towards us. Um, I'm very interested in this particular topic, but just to kind of keep us on task here, because I want to make sure we really get to the heart of it. Mm. Do you? And I, I asked this question not in a leading way at all. It's sort of. Um, Again, my, my goal here is to learn and, and you know a lot more about this than I do. So you brought up, you know, the civil rights leaders in the 60s. Do you liken that movement, uh, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and, and Malcolm X and so on and, and like the, the respective movements or, the, or if you like the collective movement that they were under? Um, how similar is, I mean, do you see Black Lives Matter as sort of a modern incarnation of that or do you see it as a separate movement with separate uh with similar but separate mission a separate separate mission well i i see it as part of the larger movement to uh, black liberation and uh black economic freedom um that we have seen different iterations of you know, uh, since, you know, really the creation of this country um, in different ways. I mean, there was abolition movements, you know, and then, you know, there were uh, movements uh, that really were around the Black franchise um, and, you know, a lot of political movements uh, to get uh, Black folks involved in the political process with a lot of success, actually, um, during Reconstruction. And, um, you know, we all know um, the compromise that, that occurred uh, that uh, ended Reconstruction and effectively, you know, locked out Black political participation for the next 100 years um, in a very systematic way. Um, and so uh, these movements build on each other. Um, but even within the movements, there is disagreement and, and, and kind of different strategies. Um, the Civil Rights Movement, when we talk about it, we kind of talk about it as if it happened over a period of one or two or three years, where, you know, you have, you know, 1955 was the bus boycott, um, the King assassination was 1968. And so you have, you know, that's a very long it's time period. Years, yeah. Right, exactly, of, you know, of struggle. And, you know, and even beyond that, there were, the movement evolved in the 1970s, you know, into something, um, you know, the Black Panther movement and and um, some of the work that they were doing, um, you know, uh, around kind of the programs that they were instituting. And so, you know, and there, there's always more kind of quote unquote radical factions, ones that want to work more within the system, ones that are, um, that are more traditional in, in approach. Um, so I, I see Black Lives Matter as being very much so a part of kind of that movement conversation. Um, I don't know if I would draw point for point parallels on every on every point, um, but I do see it as being a part of the movement towards um, you know the arc towards justice. So, um, again, I'm I, I you know I, I want to ask thoughtful questions here, and if if any of my characterizations are wrong or incorrect, please let me know. But my my understanding of the civil rights movement and the spectrum you just laid out is 
you know, Dr. King's work vis-a-vis -vis Malcolm X and, and the Black Panthers and so on, um, you know, th those were tonally very different movements, though their goals were very similar. You know, Dr. King was, was much more about peaceful protest and, and the Black Panthers, it was quite a, quite a intense militant, you know, at times violent resistance. Um, do you see Black Lives Matter as living within that spectrum or an evolution of it? Or is it unfair to sort of try to place it within the context of history? Or is it just a, a completely different movement? And then I guess as a follow on question to that, do you see the Black Lives Movement as Black Lives Matter movement as the tip of the spear, shall we say? I mean, if the goal is to, to really address, you know, systemic racism in our country, do you see Black Lives Matter as the answer, um, you know, a priori to that problem? Uh, or do you see it as, you know, sort of one movement of many different approaches that might be needed to solve this problem? Interesting. Well, um, I will say a few things. One, um, you know, as I'm talking about these things, these, you know, this is kind of, uh, you know, my thoughts on the issues. I'm not, you know, the sole authority. I don't speak for all Black people or people who are involved in these liberation struggles, nor am I a person that um, is on the street, on the ground, doing a lot of that critical work. And so I always kind of want to uh, make acknowledgments of that, especially considering um, that there are a lot of uh, people of marginalized identities that are, you know, um, that are doing a lot of that work, many of whom will, uh, you know, are named, other names that we may not know, but we should still uh, recognize their contributions. I, so I think one of the really effective things about the Black Lives Matter movement is that even though it is kind of a conversation about Black lives um, in kind of, uh, and, and what it means to be a, Black in the U.S. and, you know, the economic and political, uh, you know, struggles and, and the issues that our community faces. The frame through which that is presented is very focal, which I think is really interesting in terms of a, in terms of a strategy. It is very, 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 very focal. Um, by that, do you mean uh, defunding the police or like focus? What is it focused on? It's focused on police brutality. Yeah. And then everything else kind of comes after that. But it's very, I mean, that's why the, the movement started. It's please stop killing black people, you know, <laughs> with impunity. Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, that is that is the central focus of, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which I think is, has me, is one of the reasons why it's so enduring is because it is something that is hard to argue against. Now, there are people who argue against it. There are people who do not support that idea, just flat out. They do not support the idea that there is an issue with police brutality against black people. Like that's that, that there are people who, who do. Yeah, um, get on board with human beings killing other human beings being evil, you know, then there are so many other things down the line that are also evil. But if you can't get on board with that first very intense, insidious act, mm -hmm. you know, that's a that's a scary proposition. Uh, yes, but but we, you know, we, you know, we have that, you know, I mean, that's then that's the reality. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of people who get the point that a black person who is unarmed laying in the street um, with a knee on their neck represents a fundamental problem. They get that someone in their apartment eating ice cream, you know, and, and someone opening up their door and mistaking their apartment, you know, for another and shooting that person dead is a problem. They recognize that someone in their bedroom getting shot up from the police who are outside is a problem. And so even though there are people who do not recognize that as a fundamental problem, there are a lot of people who do recognize that as a fundamental problem. And so that in and of itself um, allows for the entree for a larger conversation about, okay, we need to stop the police brutality. We need to stop the indiscriminate killings. Uh, 
murdering, uh, murders, um, you know, uh, uh, brutality for people who aren't murdered, but who are traumatized, you know, physically, emotionally, and otherwise. Um, but we also need to talk about these other issues. And I think that is why this movement has uh, been so enduring and has been able to, you know, really kind of uh, touch on uh, so many, uh, so many different aspects um, that we really need to have a conversation about. I mean, the thing that is, um, I mean, people want to have conversations about this stuff. I mean, we, we need to have a conversation about it. Um, I mean, the fact that, you know, a lot of the, <laughs> I read an article, uh, which was interesting, um, stating that the biggest wealth transfer that's going to occur very soon um, is going to be money from white uh, boomers to their millennial, uh, to their millennial uh, kids um, or, uh, or grandkids. Um, because a lot of the policies that were created, especially after the war, specifically benefited you know, white America. Um, black people, you know, even those who fought in the war were, you know, uh, were written out of parts of the GI Bill. They were not able to access those, those uh, home loans in the same way they were redlined. Um, there were systematic ways that there was economic uh, kind of uh, uh, unbalance that, that, that has occurred. And that's on top of all of the other processes. So, I mean, I, it's sort that's of just one example. Before you were talking about, um, you know, algorithms, right, which, are, which is sort of an, a nifty little construct, like coding in racism. Mm -hmm. And like the same thing happens in legislation, right? Like mm -hmm. Reagan gets into office or whoever it is, and he passed certain legislation that redlines things and um, sort of systemically hard codes racism mm -hmm. into our society, whereby people thereafter just sort of implicitly, like maybe not even intentionally, you know, some boomer passing money to his or her offspring might have only the purest of intentions, but it's inadvertently racist, right? Um, which is sort of interesting that it's hard coded. I wanted to ask you a question, which is, th this is something I've been grappling with, Russell, which is, you know, I, I've, I've read a lot about Black Lives Matter and, and um, I, I agree with you that the, given the fact that it is so focused and it's focused on something that is so overtly evil, right? Like, mm. you know, just the merciless killing of, of black individuals in our country by police, that keeps it focused, which is makes it easier for people to understand and then rally around because it's just, as you say, there's some people who never see it this way, but to anyone with, with a brain, as far as I'm concerned, it's, you know, it's just fundamentally evil. Um, is it too focused? Because my, my concern is this, which is, um, you know, what's the head of the snake? You know, what, what, what is the problem that we're trying to solve here? Like if we're trying to solve systemic racism, systemic inequality, uh, wealth inequality in our country, things like that. If you have the movement that, that is this, the poster child for solving this problem, focused on one important but very focused thing, and let's just say the, the movement got what it wanted, right? And, and um, you know, institutional police all over our country was defunded and the killings of, of the senseless killings of black individuals precipitously declined over the next one, two, five years. Mm -hmm. What then? What about, what about the legislation you were just referring to? What about the algorithms in Silicon Valley? What about, you know, the brown track team? What about all of these other places where racism is hard coded in and it, it has nothing to do with police brutality? You know, does the Black Lives Matter movement lose its teeth because its mission has been completed? Or are, do you think they're able to galvanize around a new broader mission after that? Um, I already think that work is starting to happen. I mean, you know, you see uh, Black Lives Matter actually has a platform, you know, a policy platform that's pretty broad now that didn't exist a few years ago. Um, like I said, um, Cori Bush is a, literally, she was a Black Lives Matter protest leader. And now she is very likely going to be, uh, you know, the representative um, from the Missouri's first district. I mean, that district is heavily Democratic. She won the Democratic primary. You know, um, there's pretty much, you know, it's pretty much guaranteed that she's going to be a representative. Um, and so to have a movement, a movement that was considered pretty fringe um, in, the, in the span of about six, seven years, go from people literally in the street to, you know, um, you know now having someone uh, occupy uh, 
you know, and, and walk the halls of Congress, you know, is a pretty remarkable thing. Um, I think the movement will likely uh, continue to evolve um, as, you know, we move meaningfully forward. But I think the reason why it is kind of focused on trying to get this initial goal first, it's kind of like the Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, we need to be able to not fear, you know, uh, our safety and security first. And then we could talk about some of the other things. The other things are very vital, are very vital as well. I mean, we need to really, we really need to have a really intense kind of uh, reckoning conversation about the entrenched income and economic uh, educational inequality um, that, you know, that exists that really, you know, that that's built in. Um, and, uh, you know, the, we, need, we need to think about that. I mean, you know, think about how we fund our schools. We fund our schools with property taxes. Okay, well, that's just how it goes. Well, Wyoming actually does something a little interesting. <clears throat> now, granted, Wyoming is a very homogenous state. It's mostly white. But they have an interesting way of redistributing some of the funds from some of the um, richer school districts to poorer school districts. Um, it's not completely egalitarian um, or, or equal, but it helps to even the playing field and the disparities between their um, lower income school districts and their higher income school districts in terms of how much they pay per kid. It's, you know, not as high as a lot of other states. And so, you know, there are ways that we can address this, you know, um, but, you know, when we have a system right now where effectively ensures that if you live in a more expensive home, your child will have a far greater educational opportunity than someone who lives in a poorer home. Because if you live in a poorer home, you're likely going to be living in a poorer neighborhood and a poorer community. And that community is going to have a school that's funded much less than a school um, that is funded differently. You're building in structures that already keep one population behind and another one, you know, gives them, uh, uh, you know, a leg up. So I think we, we, we have to think about, there's going to be a, there's going to have to be a lot of kind of change, you know, systemically that we're going to need to need, need to think about. It's going to require a lot of different people with a lot of different uh, uh, ways to address it. And the thing that we also need to, realize is this is 400 years in the making. This is not something that has happened overnight. Um, you know, some of our, you know, some of the companies that are some of our biggest in, in the US, JP Morgan, um, Prudential, were made money off of, you know, chattel slavery. I mean, that, that is that is truth. You know what I mean? So it's like, uh, there are ways that this thing is so embedded and baked in. Yeah. Right. Um, and so it's it's not going to be a quick, um, you know, struggle. Um, you know, this isn't going to be something where we can, you know, go on a whiteboard and draw up a solution and then have it done in the year. Um, this is going to be a, a, a process that's going to, you know, take a long time. But I am confident, um, especially with how things are moving now, um, things are moving very, very quickly now, more so than they have in the past. So I do feel that instead of having to wait you know, the 50 years, the 100 years that uh, previous iterations of this fight, of the struggle had, had to endure, um, I think we're going to see progress happen more quickly, but quickly does not mean tomorrow. So, Russell, I'm interested, in, you know, you just said this isn't something that just, you know, snap, it's going to be one to two years and the problem is fixed, right? This is deeply entrenched. I want to connect that to a thought you know, another concern I have, which is, um, and I don't want to mischaracterize anything you've said here, so please correct me, but just sure. sort of watching, you know, you on on Facebook, and I follow you on social media and so forth, and, you know, you're, you're quite vocally a Democrat, and then also you've been quite vocal about certain Democratic candidates, you know, are, are you okay with me disclosing this? Yeah, okay. I mean, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty open on, uh, on Twitter. Yeah, but go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, Biden, obviously not being the man for the job, um, I know that you were a, a big Bernie supporter. Mm -hmm. um, my concern is, gosh, you know, politicians pander to their base. They sort of, they sort of, um, you know, the term I want to use is whitewash, which I guess is sort of racially mm -hmm. charged in and of itself, but they sort of, 
they take whatever they should be doing. Maybe they run on certain platforms, but they end up sort of watering it down over the course of their, their turn to get a second term. You know, terms for presidents are four years, for, for Congress, two. Um, so when you say things like it's not going to be snapped, boom, you know, a, a year or two or three fix, mm -hmm. what confidence do you have in our current political system and the incentive structure therein um, that the Democratic Party, even if we had the right candidate in, in Bernie, say, um, at the helm, what confidence do you have that our political system can fix this problem on a, on a protracted time period or not? Mm, yes. Um, so uh, our political system, as is currently uh, as it currently exists, especially with our hyper polarization, um, it's going to be very hard um, to get legislation through, especially if you do not have full control of, you know, uh, both the executive and the legislative branch. I mean, you need to kind of have both um, uh, and both chambers. I mean, you, you really kind of need to have all of that. Um, I think the days of kind of bipartisan uh, agreement or kind of voting on issues that are, you know, more social um, may be behind us, but we'll see. One of the really interesting voices that I kind of uh, tune into um, uh, in the uh, kind of left political landscape, media landscape, um, they said something really interesting and I, it's kind of resonated with me. They said it uh, two years ago and they said, um, and it's true, in a, in a negotiation, you do, no, you do not self-negotiate with yourself before you go to the table. And so even though we know that Medicare for all likely will not get through Congress, you don't go and say, I'm going to present a lesser version of that, because if you go and present that, the opposition is going to try to Down lower. It. Right, exactly. And so you shouldn't self-negotiate with yourself. You wouldn't do that for a job. You wouldn't say, OK, listen, um, there is a job that they're offering, you know, oh, goodness. OK, so um, I really want to try to get 90,000 a year, but um, I know that they really want to just pay me, uh, uh, you know, 95. Okay, well, I'll tell them 90. No, because you're going to end up, you know, at 86. You know what I mean? Like, you're not going to end up where you want. Um, so you don't self-negotiate. You come in at 95, you know what I mean? And you, and you try to negotiate, and then, you know, they'll probably get you down, and you'll probably be closer to the number that you were hoping to be at at the first place. Yeah, um, I just didn't worry, man, that – that's what both sides are going in with, which is like, I, you know, I'm going to come in with my, with my gloves up, right? Like we've become more there and there, you know, there are amazing graphs you can look at from mm -hmm. Reagan era politics. There's a, a questionnaire that um, both like we have a bicameral, um, you know, both, both houses of Congress um, when they are surveyed, um, they're asked like 30 questions, I think. And the commonality in the answers went from like looking like this to now there's like 18% overlap in how the questions are answered. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like literally like, it's scary, man. It's like this. So people can't agree on anything. And so my concern is I don't disagree with you. I don't think that the, you know, the left should water down important legislation. But on the contrary, if you go in with a non-watered down piece of legislation and then the right shows up with their non-watered down opinions, we end up in this. And, and again, to my point, you know, they're trying to get reelected two years later or four years later. And so they're not going to back down because they don't want to look weak for their base. I just worry we're not going to get anywhere. And, and the way I'm conceptualizing this, Russell, is like, you know, I, I cook a lot. Right. And, you, you know, you're, bo you're boiling pasta or something. You have the lid on tight. And all of a sudden you turn around and there's water all over your stove. And I think of Trump as this lid that's just down on the pasta or even our, 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 our um, legislative branch, not able to move. Mm -hmm. And there's all this unrest and unhappiness and, and good shit happening, you know, with Black Lives Matter and, and other movements. But unless that lid will dance on the top and let some of the steam out and actually change things, mm -hmm. you just have all this pressure building with no actual meaningful change. So I guess, you know, we said we keep this to an hour and we have whatever, like three, four minutes left. To the extent you agree with that or, or, or you know, maybe you don't, but what do you think, what do you think the individual can do? So I'm sure there's a lot 
we could talk for hours about what our legislative branch could do or what our institutions can and should do. But mm. on the individual level, and maybe it's an individual period, or maybe it's me, you know, it's like, here I am, you know, a privileged white man. Mm -hmm. And I'm on the sidelines of a very important moment in our, in our, in our country, wanting to be involved, but not quite knowing how or how, how to, you know, how to affect change in a way that's uh, thoughtful, sensitive, tasteful, but also meaningful and impactful. I know that's a really loaded question, but do you have any advice either for me or just people more broadly of how to, how to make change? Okay, great, great. Um, so two thoughts. One, um, just to travel back uh, just uh, really briefly. So uh, the kind of those graphs I'm that show- I'm a terrible interviewer, by the way. I asked no, you six questions. At no, no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, so I always kind of wonder about those charts that show kind of, you know, we're more polarized or before Congress used to uh, used to agree on a lot more. Now we don't as, as much. I mean, I think those are true. I also don't really see a critical kind of analysis of the fact that, yes, we are more polarized now, but Congress is more representative now than it was back then. And also our country is more diverse than it was back then. I mean, you know, um, right now, I think the country is what, 40% non-white, like in the eighties, it was, you know, what, Something, yeah. it was a lot more white, you know what I mean? So, um, and that's not to say that all white people think alike, no, but uh, there are different experiences that now have a larger kind of share, not only in Congress, but also as a part of you know, the population. And so that's going to result in kind of a different way that people are going to respond to these issues. That in addition to the fact that polarization is already is occurring, um, I just think that kind of the demographic shifts, not only in a country in our country, but also in Congress, I don't think that part is really talked about as one of the reasons why we're seeing um, one of the uh, things to think about when we're talking about polarization um, um, and, and, and its uh, effects. So maybe it's, so I think a, that's important. maybe it's a good thing that there are more voices and therefore there is polarization, but it's indicative of a uh, more heterogeneous. It's not, it's not as homogenized, maybe. I mean, you know, I don't want to attribute, you know, one thing or the other. I'm not, you know, I'm not someone who is a political scientist who has studied this, you know, in great detail. That's just one thing that I haven't seen be analyzed when I've seen uh, some of these, you know, reports or charts or, you know, um, you know, news write-ups. Um, and so that's just one thing I wanted to, to bring attention to. Around what we can do, I think there's a lot of things that we can do. It's actually funny. I um, actually um, I started running some of these workshops for my, you know, friends, uh, and now I started offering them more broadly um, to actually answer this specific question, to help people um, figure out what they can do in their lives and have a meaningful impact. And so I ran it for a bunch of alumni who were in my dance group in college. It was really I got a lot of great feedback from that. I ran it um, one. One of my interns is in uh, DZAC, by the way. Really? That's awesome. Yeah. That's dope. Awesome. Yeah. So maybe I'll connect you guys. Cool, cool. Um, uh, I held one for uh, uh, performance professionals, so people who are dancers, actors, um, uh, people in that landscape. And I'm also holding one uh, for my class, the class 2013 um and uh two weeks so i'm really excited about that and i'll be holding some more for the general public uh, so this is kind of just really kind of answering that question and really trying to get challenge people to really think about what they can do in their lives to affect change and and affecting change can come in a lot of different ways um i think we all have the ability to impact things in our lives, whether it be, you know, on a you know, micro scale or on a macro scale. And so I think what I would challenge people to do, think about where do they have influence? Where do they have influence? Where do they have kind of um, a voice or where do they have, um, you know, a place where they are respected or, you know, a, a, an arena um, where they, you know, have some sort of, some sort of import. And think about what they can do in that space to have a tangible impact on helping to affect change. So if like, for instance, um, if you are someone who, um, I don't know, uh, you know, if you're an educator, if, if you are someone who teaches, think about how you can meaningfully 
add in other aspects, uh, you know, uh, into your curriculum that, you know, gives uh, voice to other, you know, other voices that, you know, aren't necessarily a part of the traditional American literary canon or a part of um, the normal kind of curriculum uh, in middle school, high school, what have you. Um, it can come in the form of, okay, I'm going to organize, uh, you know, a challenge on social media for my friends to patronize, um, you know, five black businesses um, and, you know, to do um, and, and to, um, you know, highlight them on their social media story, you know, for one day, you know, that could take, you know, maybe like, you know, 30 minutes of work to organize and then you do it. Um, I, these are just some ways and these are kind of small and, you know, uh, things can be larger than that. You also don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are organizations that exist. You can contact them and see how you can help, um, you know, for something that is important to you. If your issue, if, if something that's important to you is food insecurity or voting or, or uh, you know, environmental justice. I mean, there are just so many different ways um, that we can all get involved, whether that is joining already existing movements um, or doing something, you know, that can have, you know, import in your, you know, uh, you know, in your lives. I mean, you know, like, uh, you know, some, you could do something as simple as, uh, you know, uh, uh, leading kind of a, uh, a, a book discussion with your family, you know, a, a multi-generational kind of uh, thing where you're really encouraging people to have conversations. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe book isn't, you know, would be uh, too, the barrier to entry would be too high for that, but maybe some sort of, um, you know, kind of, you know, once a month or once every two months conversation where you're kind of really critically getting, you know, your family involved in some of these conversations. Um, it can come in a lot of different ways. Um, I think that we all have more ability than we realize. Um, and I also want to drive home the point that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of people who are doing a lot of great work. Um, so how can you uh, latch on to what they're doing? Um, you know, and think about what's meaningful. If you work at a job and they put out some posts, that's cool. What's the retention rate at your job? Well, you know, what, what's the, what, what, what are the hiring practices? What do they look like? Um, you know, uh, are there, are there, are there, you know, uh, payment, dis pay discrepancies, um, you know, and these are conversations that might be uncomfortable. You may not have the authority to kind of have these kind of conversations, but if you are in a position of influence, um, you know, in your organization, you might need to be having those conversations. Like th there are, there are many different ways that this can kind of manifest what I'm saying. The way you just said that is interesting, right? Because that the last point you made, I think those are all awesome ideas. Um, but the last point you just made is, you know, uh, where the individual starts to meet the institution, right? Like mm -hmm. I work for a company and, you know, I, you know, they put out a post or they do something, you know, to sort of nominally support, but I want to dig a little deeper and all of a mm -hmm. sudden I realize, you know what, the, the hiring practices aren't so good or there is a pay gap or, or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an interest like where, where individuals touch institutions and then there's a level higher than that, which is where institutions touch government or, or mm -hmm. interest groups and so on. Do you, if you had to say, I mean, do you think that this is a problem that is better solved from the top down or from the bottom up? In other words, Will this, will institutions set the tone, which will then trickle down into the individual over time? Or is this going to be a movement that's built brick by brick by individuals doing, as you said, and sort of taking leadership of their immediate circle? I think it's going to require both, but I think the genesis of it, which we're already saying it's going to be from the bottom and the bottom the bottom up, which is already, I mean, it's, we're not starting from the bottom anymore. The bottom has already been built out. It's now building. Um, the thing about, you know, the uh, civil rights era, I mean, Lyndon B. Johnson was not a radical progressive by any, me any stretch of the imagination, but he signed um, some of the most important legislation, you know, arguably in American history. Um, Very reactively, I might add. I mean, it was, it, you know, it was five or six days into, into mass protests and, uh, Right. What this was in, this is in '68. Is that right? When it was signed, uh, I'm not going to lie on that date. So, but um, so I, I don't want to, uh, you know, give out false information. But yeah, um, I mean, he he ha he had a lot of you know pressure, right? Like there was a lot of societal unrest 
around what was happening. And there was a huge movement that had been built from the ground up by individuals that had, you know, that had joined arms. Um, and then that affected that, you know, to get back to my pasta analogy, the lid on the, on the top of the pot reacted, right? There was all this bubbling and legislation was passed in reaction to that, it, it would seem. I mean, he was effectively pushed. I mean, I believe he was from Texas, right? And so, um, you know, Democrat from Texas, like when has that happened, you know, since, right? And so like, I, it, it, it was, he was responding to kind of this pressure um, that had been building up, you know, for, you know, for years. Um, and so um, that ended up, you know, making its way to policy change. Um, I think any of, you know, the, the movements um, that we've seen, I mean, you know, there are a lot of kind of issues with kind of just looking at the suffrage movement without a critical lens in terms of race um, uh, kind of analysis. But the suffrage movement also was something that started, um, you know, uh, kind of, you know, with, you know, these activists and, you know, that took, you know, a long time, like 50 years. But, um, you know, it, it was a movement that eventually made its way um, you know, to affecting change from the top. So I think you need kind of this energy from the bottom to get recognized from the top and then the top then comes down. But you need to have, it's really, you need everything and you need everything in all strategies. I mean, you kind of need a robust set of strategies to make these things happen. Um, and so that's why I do not think it is not like, I do not think it, it is that it, that it is a waste of anyone's time to do things that they might feel are very small because things that are very small are still important. My ask is that you do something that has meaningful impact, even if it's small. So the difference between something small and not having an impact versus something small and having impact is, okay, if you, you know, post, uh, you know, if you post on your Facebook, um, and on your, on your Instagram about, you know, black educational gaps and you post a lot of articles and send a third. That's important. That's education. That's educating. That's fine. You might be able to do something a little different. You can maybe host someone, uh, you know, who's black, who is uh, kind of working in this space or better yet, um, you can think about, okay, um, in addition to posting those articles, why don't you uh, also, you know, try to reach out to uh, your local school and see what they're doing and see if you can volunteer, even if it's once a month, you know, to help with whatever literacy programs that they have that already exist to help, uh, you know, uh, better educate, um, you know, our children going to the future. And especially in this COVID environment, I had a lot of conversations with my friend about this. I have a pretty radical feeling about, and I think I'm going to write an article about it actually. Um, we are setting up our kids for failure um, this, this, this upcoming school year. Um, and especially our kids uh, who are coming from uh, lower income backgrounds. Um, we need to prioritize safety so they cannot be in school setting, but a digital learning environment for primary education, I do not know if we know the true uh, impacts of that. And so I think we need to have a really big, large, honest conversation about, okay, we need to keep our kids safe. They don't need to be in school, but we need to figure out how we're going to address this year and a half gap that these students are going to have. Yep. And it's going to require a long policy commitment to address that issue. Dude, I, so, I, more. I, I, I want to maybe end the conversation sort of where we began it, which is sort of What's so fascinating to me, Russell, is that you were given an outsized voice in this movement through a digital platform, right? You wrote an article on Medium and it went viral. Mm -hmm. But the last thing you just said, I couldn't agree with more profoundly, which is like, cool, so you're going to do the digital shit, like to the average person, you're going to post mm -hmm. the things you post and whatever, but it's almost the analog stuff. It's the stuff that you're like, pick up you know, pick, get your shit, get your ass out of bed and go like get off Instagram and go to the local school or go like lead a conversation with your family or like touch people in the real world and make a real impact. And so it's this really interesting tension and paradox. And you kind of touched on it when you said technology and how that's going to put people out of work and so on. It's this interesting paradox of like, 
technology gives us the chance to reach so many and have this outsized voice, but it also gives us a chance to hide you know, because there's so much noise and you can just sort of post your black square or post the article and kind of contribute without actually meaningfully contributing. And so the beauty of what happened in your case is your article had massive ripple effects in the physical world, right? You saved a, an entire track program and dozens and dozens of athletes have you and others to thank for that. Um, but don't let the digital world be a crutch or a place to hide and sort of get your guilt, you know, like wash your guilt away um, without actually meaningfully having impact and having the hard conversations or taking the hard actions. So to me, there's a pair that that's like, I could almost, you know, I'd, I want to talk to you for hours about that, that, uh, that, um, what is it called? Fault line, you know, in between the capability of technology and what it can unlock and what it's done for the Black Lives Matter movement, what it did for the Black, uh, for, for the, for the um, Brown Track program, thanks to you. But then what it's doing for so many people, which is enabling them to sort of passively participate in a dialogue without doing the actual work, you know? Yeah. I, I, um, I think that you were able to kind of crystallize a lot of those, um, a lot of the connections there pretty well. Um, and I think we uh, do need to have kind of these uh, digital, but then also uh, non-digital uh, commitments, interventions, um, kind of strategies. Uh, and so I, th I, think it, I think we really do need both um, moving forward. And I think that's something that, you know, it's not only gonna be in this space that we're looking at, um, you know, kind of that tension between digital and kind of, you know, non-digital kind of interaction. But I think uh, these are going to be ongoing conversations that we're going to be having um, in a lot of different spheres as we're, um, as we're moving forward. Um, and they, and like we talked about mental health last time and, you know, technology is one of these double-edged swords that can, that can make like you and I, we're connecting right now over Zoom. You know, I haven't seen you in a year. Um, isn't this a beautiful thing that we can have this dialogue and technology, you know, enables us to do this. But um, as we become more connected also, I mean, it's just sort of a trope, a truism, but there's also a divide, a loneliness, a, you know, a, a skyrocketing of mental health issues in our country. So I couldn't agree more, whether it's race or whether it's mental health or whether it's education, as you were just mentioning, the challenges of, of, learning remotely and so on, you know, technology will help us in many ways, but is also our great downfall if we're not careful. So true, true, true. and we can, we can discuss that one. Um, Alrighty. Always a pleasure, Russell. Thank you. Th thank you for letting me on your platform. Take care, everybody. Okay.